with the Town of Norton Zoning Board of Appeals. It's uh, 7 o'clock. And the uh, purpose of the meeting tonight um, is to uh, receive some advice and some um, tutorial on um, handling 40 Bs. We have two 40 Bs applications that have come to town in recent weeks. And I don't think any of us have them yet. Um, Nicole actually emailed just a while ago saying she has binders for each of us on the 40B paper material, I guess, Paul. So, and you have the digital copies. Do we have the copies already? Okay. Yeah, I've emailed oh, them. Right. Yes, yes, we do have. Yep. Um, in any event, if anybody wants a hard copy, um, you know, we'll have to each go pick one up at the uh, at town hall. So, I mean, these are so these are voluminous, so the hard copies may be uh, good to have. I think I'm going to go pick one up, Paul. Okay. You can you can tell Nicole uh, I'll come by this weekend or something. In any event, um, Judy, uh, nice to meet you uh, telephonically, and um, appreciate you uh, being here to uh, take part and to help us out. I, I think the program is yours and the floor is yours, correct? I think so. Okay. So I'm going to start a, a PowerPoint, which I think may have been distributed to you in the form of a a handout with like three slides per page or something. But, um, this is a training that I developed with Mass Housing Partnership about three years ago. It's been tweaked and tweaked and updated. And, you know, you do one of these and, and you get a question you haven't anticipated that makes you kind of rethink maybe how you present a particular slide. But the point of this is really to kind of give you an overview of how this process works. What we do have to be careful about tonight is that we don't talk about the cases that are coming up for you in the public hearing process um, because they're, they're going to have their own, that, they'll be in a public hearing and we just have to be careful we don't talk about them outside that. But certainly any procedural questions you have or kind of what ifs, we can certainly, you know, we can deal with that. So we, uh, we, have, we have two opening in the next couple of weeks, uh, yes. the 22nd and 29th, Paul. That's what I'm hearing. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so this is probably timely, but let me just get this going here. Very much. Yes, thank you. No problem. Um, so, as I said, this is about the comprehensive permit process. I, I sometimes I do these trainings with boards that haven't had a board be ever, um, and, and some it's they haven't seen one in a few years, and you know some of the practices change or the case law changes, and um, and so actually I've done this a couple of times with boards that have been. It was several 40 Bs, and sometimes just the ability to have a conversation about how all works or is supposed to work uh, without being burdened by the public hearing on a particular project can be very helpful. So um, you can interrupt me anytime you want through this. Um, I don't mind taking questions at any point along the way. Um, it's, I, I'm actually just sort of shut down the controls, so I won't see you if you like raise your hand or something. So I would just say if you have something to say or a question to ask, just jump in. If that's all right with you guys. Yes, that sounds great. So I want to first of all make sure everybody understands what affordable housing means because the, even this has changed a lot uh, in my time. I've been in the field for oh my God, 33 years now, and um, and a lot of the ways we used to think about affordable housing are different now. Um, most of the developments we see today come through as mixed income developments uh, without with, with little of any actual subsidy tied to them because the subsidies have largely dried up. It's not always true, but it's it tends to be true. Uh, I want to go over kind of how the process works and also what an application should look like, kind of the permitting timeline. Some of this has changed over the years, uh, how, many, how many days or how many months the board has to do certain things. Some of it is in the statute, some of it's in regulations. I want to make sure everybody understands the difference between the two. And then also make sure you know what happens after you're done. Um, because sometimes I think boards feel like there are things they should cover in their permit, which probably really aren't in their jurisdiction anyway. But the fact is that there are things they can handle by the subsidizing agency after the developer finishes with you, if the developer has an approval and is planning to go forward. So I'll make sure we kind of cover that as well. Um, I, I'm going to talk throughout this as about Chapter 40B because that's what we all call it. But the reality is that Chapter 40B is just the affordable housing piece is just one small part of the Massachusetts Regional Planning Law, um, which was passed in the early 1960s. And in 1969, 
uh, the affordable housing piece that we're all familiar with was added to the original planning law. It's important to know that this is the case because many times people think that comprehensive permits and affordable providing affordable housing are about needs that exist within a particular community. But the reality is that the law is more concerned about regional need and regional fair share. So this concept of the 10% that towns are supposed to have or, or strive to have if they you know, don't want to have large unwanted comprehensive permits hitting them, the idea of 10% is really about if you are there, you're presumed under the law to have met your regional fair share. So just that's kind of the framework of the law and we're gonna go over this over and over again. It's about regional need. Did you get that book? So, Judy, yes. uh, on here. Yeah. Um, in other words, uh, for the other members and for myself, I asked yeah. them the basic question. Yeah. We're, we're, as I understand it, right below 10%, and we have been for a few years because we have a couple projects that were never developed or acted on. One of them just expired in the last few months. Yeah. But once we reach 10%, uh, we can still get a, an application for 40B development but the criteria on which we decided is different is that right well it's really more about whether the developer has access to the housing appeals committee so i'm going to jump ahead a little bit and then i'll come back to this later but okay the whole premise is that if you're under 10 percent and the developer does not like your decision the developer has the ability to appeal to this entity called the state housing appeals committee once you've met that 10 percent that ability to go to the HAC goes away. And now the developer who's unhappy appeals your decision the way any special permit or variance would be appealed. You know, it's either land court or it's the superior court. So the main difference is does the developer have access to an appeal process where the presumption in the appeal uh, is in favor of the project? Okay. Does that make sense? It does. So our decision is still, like, if the standards are different on, on the appeal, if there is an appeal. I, I Absolutely. Think. Standards are different and, and the HAC goes away. They, they really don't get involved in a case where a town is over 10. Well, it's, still it's still a national to the community yeah. board, correct? Yes. Well, I'll see because I don't care. I'm sorry, somebody has a uh, microphone open up. You want some background noise? This guy is nothing yeah, I'm hearing that too. Okay, if, if you could all you know, use your mics or uh, make sure that there's not no TV or radio on in the background, that would be great. Right, thank you. Thank, yeah, thank you. No problem. So understanding what affordability is is probably an important place to kind of start here. There are different ways to think about affordability. Every time I've ever worked in as a planner has some affordable units that are just simply affordable because they're old, or they might be kind of um, obsolete. But under in 40B terms, an affordable unit means certain specific things. One is, is it eligible for your subsidized housing inventory? That the, the, the list of units that determines whether you're at 10%. Uh, in order to get to that list, um, it has to be affordable to households with income out of about 80% of the area median. So this gets back to the concept again. And I'll show you those regional income limits in a minute. Um, units also have to be made available on a fair and open basis to people who are income eligible. So it's households that are at or under those income limits that I'm going to show you in a minute. The unit has to be all these requirements in order to be eligible for the subsidized housing inventory. Most federal housing programs, really forever, have used a standard of a percentage of area median income for determining what is affordable. And your town is no different from any other one. We're all grouped into regional areas and the median income for that region is where you start to then determine, so what's 80% of that? And the reason for a regional median, instead of just looking at your own town's individual median, is that the regional median accounts for differences in wealth. And the easiest way I can explain this is that if you're Weston or Wellesley, you know, just think about a very wealthy town in the Boston area, if if the definition of affordability was based on non-median income, many people would not be able to afford to move into an affordable unit in the town. So 
regional median kind of is, it, it accounts for those differences in wealth and attempts to establish a definition of affordability that kind of approximates the size of a, of a labor market area. So you guys are in a special kind of region that um, the HUD creates for affordable housing purposes. You're in Taunton, Mansfield, Norton. That's a specific metro area. Uh, it's not necessarily a, a metropolitan area the way the federal gov government thinks about metro areas for like distributing uh, federal aid. But this is specifically around a, a, a labor market area within which um, one is presumed to perhaps have access to to jobs or services. So that's the region that you're in. And this is what those income limits look like. Um, if you're a one person household, the maximum income for an affordable unit under Chapter 40B is 54,950. On up to, as you can see for a household of four, it's 785. So the income limits are tiered to the size of the household, um, in addition to being at that 80% uh, of median. So, when you act on affordable housing projects, these are these are sort of the household incomes that will be, you know, benefiting from the development should you decide to approve it. The other thing that's important to understand about affordable housing that's eligible for the Chapter 40B subsidized housing inventory, which I would be on call the SHI, is that the units have to be made available on a fair and open basis to people who are income eligible for those units in a fairly large area so that we so that people who are minorities who are immigrants who have disabilities have a choice to to potentially live in your community if they wish so housing has to be offered for sale or rent under a state approved affirmative fair housing marketing plan this is an example of something that the zba does not have jurisdiction over you can always ask a developer to assist the town in getting approval for what's called local preference. And local preference may be granted for up to 70% of the affordable units in a development. It's a maybe because you do have to do a little extra work to persuade the state that it, that it's that, that there won't end up being discrimination against people in need. But you can't require the developer to go and get that approval for you, and you can't make the project contingent on getting local preference. Um, you can simply ask, ask the developer to consider it when they submit their, their um, affordable housing, uh, excuse me, affirmative fair housing marketing plan to the subsidizing agency for approval. Most of my experience is most developers will try to help you do that um, because they don't want to take off the board that they're seeking an approval from. But I just want you to understand you can't regulate local preference. That's entirely up to the subsidizing agency that's going to be overseeing the project. Does the town get notified? So what happens is before the, uh, when the affirmative fair housing marketing plan is ready to submit to the subsidizing agency, the developers who know what they're doing will contact someone at the local level. Paul is likely the one who would get that, that email or contact, um, asking, do you want to request local preference? If you do, we need the following information from you. And the developer will typically be the conduit for that information. Um, that's been my experience anyway. But, uh, so the notification will typically go to the planner or the selectman's officer, whoever ends up being the sort of point of contact for the developer once the project is through your permitting process. Okay. So let's look at kind of the basic requirements of how this process works. You know about 10%, I mentioned that. The statute actually recognizes three ways that a ZBA could deny a comprehensive permit and not be overturned by the HAC. The most common one is this 10% rule. So every 10 years when the new decennial census comes out, the HCD looks at what the Census Bureau says is your year-round housing inventory. 10% of that becomes your 10% target under 40B. This is why communities may be at 10% in you know, 2019 and in 2021 find out that they've actually fallen below a little bit because in the intervening decade, there's the market rate housing development. So the 10% number is kind of fluid. It, it basically resets, the denominator resets every 10 years. The numerator resets every time you create new units. 
So, you know, that 10% target is the same number for 10 years, but as you're adding units, those are credited to the SHI. And that's why toward the end of the decade, you can say, oh my God, we're, you know, we're 10.5% we're now. And then when the new census numbers come out, we're at 9.2. That's just kind of what happens. But that's the most common metric is this 10%. There's, there are two other ways that a board's decision to deny could be upheld. And, and another one is called this 1.5% general land area rule. And that is a standard that says, essentially, if you add up all the developable land that's zoned for residential, commercial, or industrial use in your community. So there's quite a complicated formula that goes into this, but basically we're getting out water, roads, protected open space, if 1.5% of the net land is occupied by low moderate income housing, you would be deemed to meet that 1.5% rule. And if you denied a comprehensive permit on that basis, and it was found that you were correct, the developer could not go to the HAC. The third way is if a project is so large that it would cause you to have in a single calendar year, um, 0.3 of 1% of that net land area in your community disturbed for construction of affordable housing. I actually know of only one community that has ever met that standard. Um, and I don't remember right now which town it was, but it's a very hard standard to meet. The 1.5% rule has been more controversial lately. I think some communities are sort of trying to pursue that that are not at 10%. Because essentially what it is, is if you're at 1.5% general land area, then you could be at 7% on the affordable housing units, but your decision would be just as safe from an HAC overturn as if you were over 10% on the housing units. Does that make sense? You following me? Anybody need me to clarify that? So these are three standards in the statute, any one of which a decision by the board to deny a comprehensive permit could not be overturned by the HAC. So I'm old enough to remember when the 2000 census came out, um, the housing count rather from the 2000 census, it was May of 2001. And I don't know how many of you remember, but in the early 1990s, late 1980s, we had a big recession and the housing market came to a screeching halt. And it stayed that way for much of the 1990s, but then we got around 1997 and the housing market and fully recovered, basically fully recovered. And a lot of housing development happened in Massachusetts towns. In 2001, when the census housing counts came out from census 2000, a number of communities that had been over 10% fell below. Um, because in order for chapter 40B to really work, you have to have a strong enough housing market to make the market rate units thrive. They have to be able to sell or rent quickly enough to support the affordable units. So as the market was improving toward the end of the 1990s, we did start to see more comprehensive permit development. But around 2000, what we had was this constellation of events where the new census came out, the housing market was hot, developers wanted to build, and a program that had previously been considered ineligible as a subsidy for Chapter 40B was found to be eligible. And it opened the door for a ton of comprehensive permits. So that was a war, basically, that ensued. Um, communities were, they just went to war with the state and all kinds of calls started to, to repeal 40B and the legislature generally never has an appetite to repeal 40B, but there was really concern. And so DHCD, the agency that administers 40B, stepped in and said, we'll offer some tools to communities to work toward that 10% at a pace that they think they can manage. And if they do that, then we won't make a Board of Appeals denial subject to the HAC. So it'll almost be like you're over 10% even though you're not, if you meet one of these so-called safe harbors. And the first one is called a housing production plan certification, 
So I don't know if you guys have a housing production plan, but a lot of towns do. And if you have one and it's approved by DACD, and then you, and you implement it by creating a certain number of units, um, then you can request DHCD to certify your plan and the Board of Appeals could deny a comprehensive permit for a year or maybe two years if DHCD agreed that you had met the requirements. So the HPP, the so-called Housing Production Plan, is one way for a Board of Appeals to kind of slow down the comprehensive permit process. But of course, the plan has to meet state requirements and it has to be certified in order for you to be able to say no to a developer. And Judy, we, we don't have a housing production plan. Well, I thought so. I kind of looked it up the other day, but sitting here right now, I couldn't remember. Um, we're working on it. We're updating our master plan. Oh, good. I think one of the actions that'll be, um, that should be completed uh, early to mid 2021. Yep. And I think one of the actions that will come out of it is work on a, on the production plan. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good thing to have. Um, well, the, thing, the good thing is that even if you don't have a housing production plan, you can um, you can also kind of get a, a bit of a reprieve, if you will, from approving comp permits. If you produce enough affordable housing in a single year to uh, to qualify under what's called the um, the recent progress rule, and that is a higher number that has to be met. Um, I'm trying to actually find that goal right now. You you have to you have to kind of produce more units in a single year than you do if it's a housing production plan, but you basically get credit for for producing. Um, and so recent progress is another way that if the town met it, met it, the board of appeals could deny a comprehensive permit if it wished. Of course, nothing says that you must. The different the issue is if you do, will you be upheld? Um, so in your case, that recent progress standard would be uh, uh, 134 units um, in a given year. So you issue a comprehensive permit or two. It's 134 units. You get you can you can basically basically make a determination that you've triggered recent progress and you could deny a comprehensive permit, even if you don't have an HPP. Another standard is this concept of the large project. And uh, the subsidizing agencies are supposed to review for this when a developer comes applying for a project eligibility letter. I think for the most part, they kind of do check. The concept is that, that a project over a certain size could overwhelm a community's ability to, to serve a new development. The reality is that the um, large project standard is pretty high. So in your town, I'm pretty sure it's probably 300 units. How big are these projects that are coming through the door? The two that are about to open the public hearing? Uh, one's 100 units with 25 affordable, the other 60 with 15. Okay. So somewhere between 250 and 300 is the cap on what would be a large project for your town. And all that means is that if the developer came forth and applied for a comp permit for a project that exceeded that threshold, the board would be able to turn it down and not be over appeal, not, not be overturned by the Housing Appeals Committee. These are all, mind you, in regulations. They are not in the statute. The last piece that DHCD added in 2001 um, and updated in 2008 is this concept of the, the related application. And what that means is a developer goes to the planning board, uh, wants a subdivision, and for whatever reason, it's turned down. Planning board determines that the developer is not eligible for some division approval. The developer says, I'm going to get you, I want to come back and apply for a comprehensive permit. They cannot do that. So if there has been a rejection of a permit for a site that then uh, becomes the subject of a comprehensive permit, you could turn that down if there had not been this waiting period of a year. There has to be an actual like, application for approval. It can't be like a zoning change or something like that. When the applicant comes to you, there are certain things that applicant must demonstrate. So needless to say, 
when I start getting into your applications for these projects, these are things I'm going to be looking for. First of all, you know, is it a nonprofit? Is it a public agency or a limited dividend organization? Most comprehensive permits today are limited dividend organizations, which means, as you probably know, it's a for-profit developer who agrees in exchange for the ability to build higher density housing um, that they will limit their profit. So that's what a limited dividend organization organization is, and most of these projects come through that, that way. They have to have evidence of site control. Doesn't mean they have to own the property, but they at least have to have a PNS agreement. They have to have something to show they have site control and therefore are eligible to apply for this approval. And the third thing they have to have is what is this project eligibility letter, which I know you're all familiar with, in, in which the sub, a subsidizing agency, usually mass housing, sometimes it's mass housing partnership, Sometimes it might be DHCB, but usually Mass Housing has given a, an initial cursory review and determined that the site is basically okay for the proposed use and the proposed use is, is, is generally okay for the site. That doesn't take away the board's ability to review the project for design, for environmental, you know, environmental impact or anything else. It's simply like a, um, it's almost like a smell test. You know, it's kind of that level of review that Mass Housing does uh, in order to say, yeah, you can go ahead and apply to the CBA. They, they, they try not to step into the role of the local permitting authorities, um, which you know can be a good thing, but it also can be frustrating for towns. Sometimes I work with a board that has an application for a site that you kind of wonder, how did this get a PBL? But um, they, I, I think that the other thing I'll say in fairness to the housing subsidizing agencies, is that their perspective is to get housing built. So if an applicant comes forth with a request for project eligibility, it's sort of like the law is on their side, if you will, and the subsidizing agency is probably going to issue something. If not for what the applicant requested, then something close. In addition to evidence of those three things I just listed, the application should have these things. You know, it will have at least a preliminary plan you know, a site plan, a, if there's a subdivision involved, they should give you a preliminary subdivision plan. Um, these are not gonna be construction ready plans. That happens at a later date when the applicant comes back to the building department seeking a building permit. But your plans are really supposed to be, you know, of, of sufficient detail that you can determine what is gonna be built and where it's gonna be built and is it feasible. Those plans have to include basic things like, a, you know, what are the existing conditions on the site, a locus map. Um, there should be preliminary scaled architectural drawings of sufficient detail that you can picture what's, what's going to be built. They need to give you a tabula tabulation of how many buildings, what type of buildings, what's the ground cover for the project, um, where the utility is going to, how the utility is going to be connected to the site what utilities will be provided. Um, so you have a sense again, of, like, is this project feasible and how's it gonna get constructed? And, and centrally, of course, they have to give you a list of the waivers they need. This is where the Board of Appeals Authority under 40B is really unique. Um, you have, through the comprehensive permit, jurisdiction over all local regulations. So for example, when a site is subject to both the state wetlands law and a local wetlands bylaw, the Conservation Commission retains jurisdiction under State Wetlands Act, Chapter 131, Section 40. But the local wetlands bylaw falls to the ZBA. And this is why in cases where we have wetlands on a site, which is pretty common, it's really important for the Conservation Commission and the ZBA to communicate and work together. Um, similarly, if an application comes through the door that is subject to Title V, you know, it's not going to be sewer, it's going to be an uh, on-site wastewater system. If the town has local septic system requirements that exceed Title V, the applicant can ask you for a waiver of those local regulations, but they still have to satisfy Title V with the Board of Health. So those waivers are critical, and we always look at those right away. Um, sometimes developers get a little bit sloppy and they just sort of list the waivers they need, but they don't tell you 
to an extent. And I'll give you an example. Um, an applicant might say, I need a waiver of your height limit because the building's going to be higher than 35 feet. But they don't tell you. <laughs> so we, we want approval to build the building up to 35 feet. They have to tell you what the parameter is that they're seeking as part of that waiver. So we always look to the waivers for completeness with you. Um, I can't stress th these dates enough. <laughs> these are really critical. Um, and we've had a few problems with these, sometimes in communities that haven't seen a comprehensive permit for a while. Um, the, the, the dates that you see on here that are in bold type are statutory. Um, actually, notice the public hearing should be in bold too. But once that application comes through the door, you get it out right away to the entities in town that are going to help you review it. So, like the planning board, fire department, police department, building department, um, if you have a design review board, if you have conservation, you know, whoever you need to help you review this plan needs to get those plans right away. You run a, a, a public hearing notice, just as you would for a special permit or variance, you know, two notices twice in two weeks, uh, 14, at least 14 days before the, the hearing. You, under 40B, this is one of the things that is so important to keep an eye on. You must open the hearing in 30 days. You know how with a special permit or variance you have 65 days? No. It's 30 days under 40B. And we've had a few communities that didn't know this, and so the developers kind of kept quiet because they certainly knew. And then as soon as day 31 arrived, the applicants went to the Housing Appeals Committee and requested what's called constructive approval because the town had not met the statutory requirements. So that 30 day timeline is critical. And, and we're going to meet it. Yeah, I know. Yeah. So they're both, they're both in. And we already, we met the first, uh, the seven day. Yeah. And then the notices have been sent out, both yeah. notices. Well, one's been sent out already, the other's ready to go. So yeah. we're, we're ahead of that. And that's good. I mean, it's just, you know, a lot of this stuff kind of up front isn't that different, except the date, the date, the deadline for opening the public hearing. And I will say, if you, for some reason, could not meet that 30 days, say somebody applies, you know, near the holidays, usually developers will simply agree to extend yeah. the 30 day limit for opening the hearing. But of course, you always want to get that in writing. And you always want to make sure the town clerk has a copy. Um, if you think that you could deny the application for one of those provisions I mentioned earlier, you're at 10%, or you think you meet the 1.5% rule, or you have a housing production plan that's certified, et cetera, then you have to notify the applicant within 15 days of opening the public hearing. We think we could deny your, your permit because. The applicant can appeal, most of them do, uh, appeal to DHCD and say, I think this board appeals is wrong. And DHCD steps in, they're supposed to answer within 30 days. Um, they sometimes will not be able to meet that deadline. The review process is complicated um, and it gets kind of contentious. So anyway, while that's all going on, this 180 day period that I'm about to mention next kind of goes on hold. The standard is that once you open the public hearing, you're supposed to bring it to a close in 180 days. So that, the that, thing, that, me? that hasn't happened once in Martin in the last 15 years, I can tell you that. I mean, we've always got extensions. Right, right. I, I'm just telling you what the regulations said. Right? Do any towns actually do this within six months? Yeah, I've seen some make it through in six months. Um, they, they will be able to do it this time, but it's... Projects that are smaller, innocuous, um, maybe don't have a lot of the brothers, uh, sometimes we'll just move through. Um, but no, I mean, listen, the sites are often compromised sites. It's why they're in 40B and not from some other permitting process. So that often there tends to be complications with the sites. Um, you know, and it might be the site, it might be access to the site, whatever, these things get complicated. Um, some towns have a lot of trouble organizing the review process. Um, I have a very small town ZBA that I'm working with right now, you know, obviously in another community, that just didn't have anything in place about hiring people, new consultants or whatever, and it's been really hard for them. Um, so in places like that, 180 days is just, it's a joke. It doesn't work for them. 
Um, but, you know, uh, the, uh, the other thing I, I can tell you is this is just my experience. The developers who do a lot of 40B work, ironically, are, are usually the best ones to work with because they kind of know the drill and they know what the board needs and they just want a yes. And so if you ask for something that's not totally out of back, they will tend to do it. That's just been my experience. The developers who are not accustomed to 40B, who have kind of been led down the garden path of thinking it's a 40B, I can get whatever I want. Those guys can be a little bit, I'm kind of them guys, it's not fair, but those applicants can be a little harder to work with. Um, they have to kind of learn that now just because it's a 40B, you don't get a yes. You know what I mean? So I generally they go over 180 days, but I've seen them come to a close close to that. Um, so a lot of it I think comes down to how the process gets organized. And we can talk about that in a matter of a couple of slides. Um, yeah. As you may know, did you have a question? Did I, oh, Judy, I was just going to say, I've um, already started calculating the dates. So what I'll do for your material uh, for each meeting is I'll make sure you're aware of these important dates. Yeah. Um, so we'll know, you know, especially where the 180 day is that we're, if we need to, we need to extend it. Right. That's good. I mean, just keep those dates in, in front of you. Uh, it's the best I can advise. Uh, Judy, uh, one question. Um, after the board issues its decision, do we still have 14 days to draft and get that stamped? Every board I've ever worked with makes sure that decision gets filed within the 40 day period. Uh, so when that decision. I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, so the, that decision isn't uh, the night they make the. No, once you close the hearing, you have 30 days to reach the decision, to make, to make the decision. To dr and, and have, you mean complete it, have it stamped and... That is what every board I've ever worked okay. with. Has okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, from, from what I've seen before, we've always had at that point in time, all a draft decision yes. that's, okay. gone, that's gone between us and town council and the applicant a number yep. of times. Yeah. Because those waivers are the things that we'll need of this. And we all, that's what we always end up negotiating on the waivers. And so it's kind of already in play, yeah. uh, you know, weeks before that final say of yes. Okay. Oh, you are so right. You are, that is exactly what I try to advise my boards to do, is before you even close the hearing, yeah. you know, he's got a draft of, if we're going to approve it, these are the conditions that we would approve. And here's the decisions on the waivers. So the applicant knows, before you close the hearing, and the abutters know, everybody knows right. what you're going to put in that permit. And so if the applicant says, oh, I'm fine with all that, it makes it a little hard for them to appeal later. That's just, that's how it's operated. And we've had good town council assistance. So now with Paul uh, and Nicole at the helm, uh, yeah. that'll certainly, yeah, we'll, we'll do that. Yeah. Yeah. And really have to marshal everything into one thought model anyway. And that's the right. right way to do it, have a draft decision that work gets worked on for weeks or even several meetings you know right. mm -hmm. so to, um, go ahead i'm sorry i was going to say to, to that end um one of the things we just started doing with the planning board that i'd like to try to do here with you all is um we've created a tracking sheet yeah. that identifies issues and any conditions that have come up during the public hearing that way we can track it and then as you start getting to the point of making a decision you can use that tracking sheet to go, okay, do you know, and use that as a, a way to help get your uh, your conditions together. Um, so this is, I mean, these are very similar to what we do with the, with the planning board for special permits and site plans. So it's nothing. I, but when I saw read that, I was like, does that mean forty days means everything's done, or does that mean they have to at least vote on a decision? But now I got to get it that it's got to be done, done stamped and all so we'll be ready yeah i mean i will tell you that i think many town councils will advise and I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with them that you have 40 days and then 14 to file it i do not advise my boards to do that i just don't and i actually i think most town councils don't either but you know i, I would say by the end of that 40 day period you need to have that decision in the town clerk's hands that's my advice okay and then, of course, once it's filed, the same standard applies to a comp permit as to a special permit or a variance. 
they have 20 days to, if someone who's not happy with the decision has 20 days to appeal. Um, the applicant can appeal to the Housing Appeals Committee. Uh, other interested parties would go to court. So that's just overview of the timeline. You probably do this anyway, but I want to just emphasize it. Um, after you've opened the hearing, um, let the applicant present their case or whatever, schedule a site visit. If you just get out and take a look at the property. You really want to understand with the plans in your hand, um, what is this site and what's kind of the neighborhood look like and how's this building going to sit on the site? How what's the access to the building with the property going to be? And who are the abutters that are most going to be affected by this project? I don't think there's any substitute for getting out on a site with the plans in your hand and taking a look at what's going on. It certainly helps to perhaps uh, refine your questions to the applicant or to your own peer review consultants as you go know, through, through the process. The site visit's really important. Um, and you may do that as a matter of course. I sometimes find that boards don't, so I feel compelled to kind of say the site visit is really a good idea. Peer review consultants, I don't know what your process is in Morton, so I'm going to just talk generally about this. The board has the right to hire peer review consultants to assist with the review of the applicant's submission. You don't get to ask the applicant to pay for studies that are not part of the application. But certainly, you know, there's an engineering, there's a, there's a site plan, there's usually a traffic study, the architectural plans, you know, you decide early on, sometimes it's the first night, usually it's the later than the second night, what consulting assistance do you need to review this particular application? Um, and then you, you know, you basically, uh, you know, sometimes I work with have these guys on call and they just go to their on call list and they call up an engineer and they call up a traffic consultant or whatever. Sometimes do an individual procurement on these every time. Um, that's totally up. To, I, I don't want to disturb your process, but if you don't have an on call list, it, it's a good idea to get three quotes. Um, but if you, you know, if you have a consultant you've worked with a lot, it really is not necessary. The point is that you want to get those consultants lined up because this 180 day clock is much easier to manage if you know what needs to be reviewed and you can start to schedule it. Um, the typical peer review I see is civil engineering, traffic, and architecture. Um, if there's a wetlands issue that's really sensitive, uh, sometimes the board will hire a, a wetlands scientist who is also advising the Conservation Commission. Um, I don't always see that, but I often do. Ordinary has a provision that essentially says you can't, as a board, impose a condition on a project that would make it uneconomic for the developer to build. Uh, in the old days, old days, pre-2008, it wasn't uncommon for, for boards of appeal to want to look at the financials of a project right up front. That all changed with a decision that was issued by the state Supreme Judicial Court um, in the town of Amesbury. And so the way we do this now is we don't jump to the financial performance of the project. We listen to the applicant's presentation, you get the application reviewed, you ask your questions, and we basically ask the developer what you would like the developer to do. And if the developer says, okay, fine, I'll do all those things, you don't need a performa review because the things that you want the applicant to do is said or she said they'll do. The rub comes when you ask the applicant to do something and the applicant says, I can't do that, you're gonna make my project uneconomic. At that point, you can say to the applicant, fine, give us a, a development pro forma that shows you can't do this. So the applicant comes back with a pro forma that shows that what you want them to do is not gonna work. You can then hire a, an independent consultant to review that pro forma. To be honest with you, I try to advise my boards to stay out of that unless you absolutely can't avoid it. And I'll tell you why. There's two reasons. First of all, we used to have a stable of consultants that would do pro forma reviews. And for the most part, they seem to have dried up and none of us quite know why, but they're not doing it anymore. I think there's a general amount of unhappiness with some of the standards now for 
uh, for what constitutes a physical pro forma, um, not only and happiness on this part of towns, but also on the part of developers. So people are doing this. And, um, but even if they were, the other problem you've got is if you hire a peer review consultant who comes back and says, you know what board, that applicant's absolutely right, they can't do this. Now you've lost your leverage. So it's better to try to negotiate as much as you possibly can and avoid getting into an argument about the financials. If you can't avoid it, then you deal, you deal with it. But don't start there. Start with, I think that the best framework any board can have in any of these projects is how do you get the best project you can for your town? Because if you kind of start from that perspective and you're focusing on quality and the things that the board can actually review, it's more likely that you're going to end up in a place where you're issuing a decision for a project that you can be proud of um, and the applicant can actually build. Uh, bear in mind that any kind of written reports you, sub you, you commission from a civil engineer or whoever all becomes part of the record for the project. Some towns I work in have a really great engineering department that usually reviews plans for the planning board. Um, we, we use the staff matter plans and so forth. And I would certainly say include your town staff because that's important. But I also think it's important to recognize that if you end up at the Housing Appeals Committee, you need independent consultants. The perspective of the HAC is not very friendly to boards of appeal, unfortunately. Um, and I don't mind saying this, I don't mind being repeated or, or quoted. You know, it's, it's a process that kind of, again, is on their side of wanting to see housing built. So the difficulty you have, if it's, your, if it's only your town engineer who's saying the stormwater system isn't gonna work, and the applicant's got three engineers saying, well, yes, it will, is that you've sort of this one person who's kind of perceived in that, that appeal process as kind of speaking from the perspective of the town. And what you want is actually someone who can assert greater independence. So for that reason, I think it's a good idea to have independent peer review consultants, even if your town staff are involved in reviewing these plans. Um, and, and the consultants and the staff should communicate. But I, I strongly recommend that you at least get those disciplines that are reflected on this slide uh, involved. So, so Judy, I just have a couple of questions. Um, yeah, sure. One of the projects, uh, Chris, our building commissioner is asking for a structural peer review is that something within our ability uh, to require it? He has you know, legitimate concerns about the integrity of the building they're trying to preserve. And he's asked them a couple of times that we would like to have a, a for a structural peer review. Well, the board can request it. Bear in mind, all these have to come through the CBA. Okay. So no separate department should be asking these guys to do peer review studies. If the building commissioner feels that that's important, by all means, put it in writing to the ZBA. I can also do that during the permitting process. And that's what I was going to say. They can have an appeals process to the BBRS as well. So um, I, I might just note it during the, um, the 40B process and then uh, take it up myself. I'm with you. That's exactly what I think you should do. Because there is this other thing of like, what belongs on this side of the building permit or what belongs on your side? That's and I think that that is something that probably belongs on your side more than the boards. Agreed. Okay. Oh, this is uh, going to be good. You guys know your stuff. Um, the other thing, I see Jen's on the call too. Uh, Jen's our conservation director. Yep. Um, now, uh, these projects will fall within uh, Conservation Commission's uh, purview as well. Yes. So, uh, our, how, Judy, how would you suggest we coordinate on the peer review? Uh, you know, uh, you know, for for stormwater and wetlands, which are things that could fall both, you know, could fall uh, under under conservation commission. Do you have a local wetlands bylaw? Oh. Are you, or is the conservation commission normally acting only under one thirty one section forty? Uh, Jen, uh, she's not able to comment, but we don't have a local wetlands. Then, so then you're not going to. Go ahead, I'm sorry. That's so they, it's under the State Wetlands Protection Act. Therefore, the applicant isn't going to be asking the Board of Appeals for any relief under the local wetlands bylaw. Paul, Jen's uh, giving you chats right there. She yep. said no. Yeah. Uh, need the chat. Yeah. So, okay. So they're going to just work. So with wetlands, they're just going to work through uh, 
that's going to be through Con uh, Conservation Commission then. Yes. Now, if the Conservation Commission has jurisdiction under a local stormwater bylaw, any local bylaw comes to the CBA. The okay. commission's jurisdiction for comp permit is limited or confined to one section, 131 section 40. So if there's anything the applicant's requesting that's for relief for a waiver that somehow CONCOM would normally be involved with, then, then there may still be a reason to, um, to work together. But I would just say generally, um, you know, it's just the Conservation Commission is certainly going to be a reviewing party on these comments, oh, yeah. make comments to the CBA. So that is always helpful. It's just that it's more complicated when the CBA is handling the local wetlands bylaw. Yeah, in this case, uh, the, the, the local bylaws, the stormwater. Okay, so we have, not, to, have to look at the waivers. Yeah. And we can talk about that more when we get into those specific. Sure, sure. I, it was just trying to, you know, as a general level, what are we, you know, how do we coordinate on, you know, on, on our peer reviews? Yeah. So I don't know, you know, again, we just have to be careful when we're talking mm -hmm. about specific projects. but. Right. Some developers will, will file with CONCOM pretty early on, and some of them just wait till they've got their comprehensive permit. Um, but for stormwater, I would say really the decision is going to come down to um, what is the applicant asking for relief from? Because if the applicant doesn't ask for any waivers under the local stormwater bylaw, they're saying they're going to comply with it. That's essentially what they're saying, but they're not seeking any relief. That makes sense? Yeah, I'm just writing. That's okay. Do you want me to keep going or do, do anybody else have any comments or questions? So this is stuff that often comes up. <laughs> questions that tend to come up in these processes and you know, and none of this I think is going to surprise you because it sounds to me like you're a pretty experienced board, but you know, does the project meet the state's stormwater management requirements? Because that's really what they have to meet. And if they don't ask for relief from a local stormwater bylaw, then they're subject to it. But they absolutely, you know, you want to know, like, does this actually work? Um, is the stormwater management plan adequate to, to protect your high properties? Um, is the access safe for cars and for people who are on foot and bicycles? And does the interior circulation make sense? What's the construction plan, management plan, and how will traffic entering and exiting exit the site be managed? You know, some projects this is not a big deal, and some of them it's huge. Um, projects that involve a lot of fill, or a lot of excavation, there's going to be a lot of trucks coming in and out. Um, there needs to be some thought into how do you protect a neighborhood or a, you know a, the part of town where the project's going to be built from a traffic impact that could be pretty significant during the construction process. And Judy, um, Judy, these are all, I, I'm going to bullet points, these are all things that we talked about even in the last one, the last application. I'm sure they were. Yep. The applicant had to uh, do some road construction. I mean, they came willing to do it anyway, because uh, yep. it's a bad, uh, was a bad uh, corner, and also there was a vertical, uh, you know, a hump on the road that they flattened and everything. So this is all very helpful and it's also bringing back memories of... <laughs> Our nightmares yeah. is the case maybe. You know, I wasn't going to say that, but yeah. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you. No problem. Um, and then some more, just some more questions. And, and again, I think you guys are pretty experienced, so none of this is probably a surprise, but I do always feel like I need to just sometimes have to give a board permission to say you do have a right to ask questions. You know, what is this building, what are the buildings going to look like when they're viewed from the road and from nearby properties? And that's where a site visit really is so helpful. How are the buildings situated on the site? And are the setbacks and massing and scale appropriate? Um, we had one come through my town that was really dreadful. Uh, it was a spike project, too. But uh, there was one, it was a single family, uh, 40B, those often are not very successful. But one of the houses was situated on a proposed lot in such a way that the next door neighbor was going to be literally looking up at a 35 foot wall uh, because of the grading. And, and, you know, this is stuff that's just simply not acceptable. And, um, you know, so you want to make sure you kind of understand what is this going to feel like to the people around them. And it's not a question of density, it's really about siding and scale and massing. 
Um, what's the lighting plan and how is it going to affect nearby properties? Make sure you get a landscaping plan. Um, I, I can't emphasize this enough. You know, every, anything you do to try to press for the highest quality project you can get is not only going to benefit the people in your neighborhoods, but also people who are going to live in this development. So don't be afraid to, to insist on quality. And then are the proposed open spaces adequate and functional? In other words, people are going to live here. You know, are there places for kids to play? Are there places for people to walk? I mean, what is the outdoor space going to be like? So the landscaping plan, the site plan can kind of shed light on all of that. Um, I, I'm not, I don't want to comment about these particular projects, but a couple that I've worked on that were really big, like apartment developments, this became critical. We had a 300 unit developments with no open space, and that's just not right. Um, I, I'm always griped that the subsidizing agencies, I think, don't give enough focus on this when they're doing their review, but as I said, they feel like it's up to the CBA. Well, you know, once you have a hand in a comprehensive permit, your jurisdiction is somewhat narrow. But I would just say, really, these are things that are appropriate and within the confines of the statute that you are authorized to act under. So don't be afraid to ask these kinds of questions, and of course, others. Judy? Yes. I didn't break you in. Yeah. I see on the last slide, dark sky compliant. Yeah. There's another standard that's become popular, the green uh, energy efficiency uh, standard. Yeah. Yep. Are those, I thought we were not able to impose the green standard the last time we did this, maybe four years ago. What, what's the status of those two standards, for example? You know, can we say we need you to be dark sky and we, we want you to be energy green star compliant or not? Well, here's, here's, here's an answer that's probably going to drive you crazy. Um, you can't ask a comprehensive permit project to do things that other developments are not required to do. So my understanding is that, you know, no, you really can't require some of those things. Some of this is building code. But if your town has a dark sky bylaw. That is exactly it, Judy. We didn't have the energy green, green certification, whatever it was. We may now, I don't know, Paul, but that was the exactly. code. Council told us a few years ago you can't do that. Right. Right. But the code has changed too. So, you know, I think that there are things they have to do now, but it's not your problem, if you know what I mean. So, uh, did, I, did I cut somebody off? I didn't mean to. I, I, well, when we're ready, uh, Jen has a question uh, about open space. Does she have the question now? I can't see the chat box. But yeah, yeah, it's uh, the def the open space definition talks about restrictions uh, running uh, with the title. Uh, does that mean that open space component needs to have a deed restriction? So open space, this is lowercase os. Yeah. This is, is it, and I, I, I hate to oversimplify this, but when we talk about open space in a multifamily development, it's, is the entire site moved? Are there areas where people can walk, where where kids can play? Um, it's really about sort of the you know the the living spaces outdoors around a building more than open space in the sense of a conservation restriction. If there is a natural heritage issue, a natural heritage requires a conservation restriction to protect certain open space that's essential for um, for very endangered species. That's one thing. But open space in the context of a comprehensive permit is not about conservation as much as it is usability and functionality for people. Am I making sense? Yeah, and, and um, both, of, I know we're not supposed to talk about sites, but both have access to the reservoir. Mm -hmm. That's been a conversation with both of them that I've had that get some usable open space that, you know, residents can enjoy Right. And use. Right. That's, that's kind of what this means. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about open space in another slide or two, but, but, but for purposes of reviewing a specific project, the open space questions mainly are about functionality, usability, um, you know, for the enjoyment of the residents of the project. Not always, but usually. So hold that thought. To make that 180-day cycle work, um, it is important as soon as you can, like I said a few minutes ago, 
you know, at the first meeting and then later in the second to kind of get clear in your own heads what are the big issues you want to focus on and, and get, keep those in view. Uh, if, if you need additional information from the applicant to understand what's going on, don't hesitate to ask for it. As long as it's information that involves your jurisdiction, you should ask for it. Where, where, where tension builds up is when boards ask applicants for information that, that really is not what the board is supposed to be talking about. Um, if you need graphics to understand the height of the building or the massing, you know, ask for it. Those are things you have a right to ask for because they fall within the sort of general domain under 40B of valid local concerns. So here's your scope. Your jurisdiction as a ZBA is under, is the zoning bylaw. You know, this is really all the things the applicant may have to ask for waivers of and that falls to the ZBA. You're the entity that's going to give approvals or not <coughs> with respect to zoning, subdivision control, um, local wetlands by law if it exists, or, or septic eggs. Uh, if there's a local historic district involved, you inherit that, that jurisdiction. And scenic roads, if there's a scenic roads by law that applies. Um, for any of these local rules, the applicant can ask for waivers. <coughs> that the applicant thinks are necessary to allow the project to go to go forward. It is the applicant's problem to figure out what they need waivers from, not yours. So, you know, sometimes go ahead and kind of say to the applicant, well, you know, you're going to need a waiver of X and you didn't ask for it. And it's not uncommon in this process for an applicant to come forth halfway through the process and ask for a, a, an amended waiver list which it just just know that that often happens and sometimes it's for perfectly legitimate things the board may have asked the applicant to do something the applicant agrees to do it it now triggers some other you know waiver need that perhaps was not contemplated with the original plan so i'm not saying there's anything bad about that it's just that sometimes the waiver list does get updated as the project goes forward in the review process there are things that that are not within the board's purview. And I, I don't like to spend a lot of time on this, but I do think it's kind of helpful. You're, you're basically reviewing a project for the same kind of considerations any other development would, would be reviewed for. Safety, health, you know, does it function properly? Does the use, you know, is the site designed appropriately, appropriately for the proposed use? What often happens with these projects, especially with 40B, is that people will raise concerns about too many kids in the schools, and that is not within the ZBA's purview. I can't emphasize enough, shut that stuff off because it becomes a fair housing problem. So you just, you can't, you can't restrict a comp permit because you think there's gonna be kids living there. So I'm not saying you would anyway, but I'm just, I feel like I, I need to just say this. That is just testimony that's not helpful to the board and it really shouldn't even be in the record. So. Sometimes I give my boards big, po big posters. I know I'm all virtual right now, so it's not going to help, but I've had these big posters that I've given my, my boards to put up in front of the hearing room so people know, like, this is stuff we can't do, and these are things we can do. So the rules are clear to the participants. Um, you, you, you can't ask for a fiscal impact study. You may be able, of course, to review a project for whether the infrastructure and the utilities are adequate. That's one thing. But whether, it, whether a project is going to require a lot of calls to the police department or something, it's just not in the CBA's purview, any more than it would be in the subdivision. Um, tenant home buyer selection is controlled by the subsidizing agency. That's all part of that um, fair housing plan I mentioned earlier, the affirmative marketing plan. Uh, profit monitoring is clearly in the hands of the subsidizing agency. Usually what happens in my experience is that when the project is done and the applicant has to submit to the subsidizing agency, what we call a final cost certification, that is shared with the town for review. But the town doesn't have approval authority over it. It's really for your information. Um, you, you don't have the ability to ask for a market study. The subsidizing agency will do that at a later point if they haven't already done it. And then um, the board can't impose restrictions on the income limits on a project. Those are set by the subsidizing agency. Now I want to step back just a little bit. I have had some involvement with a few projects where a board asked an applicant to consider making a few units more affordable than what was proposed. The typical standard is 
These units will be affordable to people at or below 80% of median income. In some communities, there's a desire to serve lower income people. So the boards will ask the applicant to make some units more affordable. And sometimes, you know, the numbers work, the applicants will do it um, because they're trying to get to a yes. So they want to please the town or the city. Um, the subsidizing agency used to allow that to go forward and they didn't, they didn't do anything about it. Lately, I've noticed that they're kind of getting very picky about about even that kind of condition in a permit. Um, it's kind of like they're kind of asserting their jurisdiction to, to the nth degree. I'm not saying that that would even be an issue with Martin, but just so you know, um, you actually can't, you can't set the income limits for a project. You certainly can ask a developer to consider doing certain things, uh, serving a lower income uh, population for some units or providing more accessibility than perhaps the law requires but you can't impose it. I think that's the difference. You can ask and an applicant can agree, but you can't impose it as a condition of approval. Judy? Yes. What about the um, question, uh, is the developer willing to add another one or two units to the affordability side, you know, over 25% in other words? You right? can ask, I've seen developers do that. I have seen them agree to do it, especially if things have been going along fine and everybody's getting along, you know. I've seen them agree to do it, um, there's a way I would deal with that. I wouldn't make it a condition of approval. Right, but well, you can't, right? So I would put it in the decision. So I, didn't, I don't know how you write your decisions, but I, mine has a procedural history, I have a description of the governing law, I have the findings of fact, and I have the decision with the conditions. Well, in the procedural history, this is where I tend to put this stuff. It's like, so, you know, at, at such and such a hearing on such and such a date, the board asked the applicant to consider uh, adding two more affordable units at the request of the affordable housing trust. The applicant agreed to do this. It's in the decision. Mm -hmm. So the subsidizing agencies, they get mainly worried about conditions of approval and somebody stepping on their turf. Mm -hmm. I can only tell you that if the developer is honest and agrees to do it, they will do it. Um, it's just that the subsidizing agencies don't want you stepping into their turf. So we can't well, say, we couldn't say, okay, you're at 25% with 14 units, but we want a 15 unit, be, which would put them over, you know, they put them to 27 or 28%, because that's not what the law says. That's right. Obvious, right? But you can ask. Right. You could okay. ask. Okay, thank you. No problem. Hey, Judy, it's Jim. I have a quick question for you. So I was on the zoning board in New Jersey, and again, I understand it's totally, a little totally different. Oh, Mount Moral. Yeah. yeah. So I, I know we went through one of these, and again, totally different process. Yeah, it is a different. Yeah, it is very different. So I, I just want to make sure, because I, I know one of our big sticking points was the fire department. Yeah. And when they wanted to put one of these projects in, we had close, uh, they were trying to cram in so many apartments or you know car you know it was really townhomes and then a couple of units on the end with the affordable housing where they can meet their their quota um but they were doing that and in doing that they were not really when we consulted with the fire department they're like hey listen if we, if we get a fire truck in there it can't turn around so you know what i mean so our impact on municipal is that still saying that we can't consult with the fire department? Oh, no, you definitely want to have input from the fire department and you want to have input from the police department. I don't want to mis I don't want to mislead you. Definitely get their input. Okay. The issue is that in the end, the applicant has to make the fire code, right? So okay. if the fire chief says, I can, I, can, I can get around, you know, two thirds or three quarters of this building, I can get to the roof, where, you know, it's not like the PBA can impose additional requirements. Okay. And, and if the fire chief has a real concern, I would say, get the fire chief at a hearing to say that. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you what the applicants know. They know that public safety is like the death of a 40B. So they'll often, I saw, I saw this happen with a project on the Cape where the applicant hired their own public safety consultant to debate with a recently appointed fire chief. Wow. Uh, oh yeah, it got really it was wild. And um, 
and the fire chief just wouldn't budge. He just really felt like I can't serve this project to this. Um, and so the applicant's attorney, who's a wonderful man and does a lot of funny B work, just kind of told his client, you know, we're gonna lose this because public safety is this thing that you just don't cross. But the fire chief has to have a rational basis for what he usually right. says. So, you know, I would say if you have a real concern about public safety, by all means get their input. Just so you know, uh, to, to other members, what we've done in the past is we actually you know, done a memo to all the town departments, but principally uh, police, fire, water, sewer. Yep. Said, we would like your comments uh, at a hearing, at a meeting, our upcoming meetings are X and Y. If you can't, you know, send somebody to attend, can you at least apprise us in writing of your view of this from all aspects of, you know, within your purview? And most of the time, the fire, the police and water sewer has come to a hearing to to tell us uh, what they have problems with. And so we're allowed to do, we're allowed to do all that and to get their input. It's just that the decision is up to us, right? right. Okay. I completely agree. And I, I mean, if they will come to a hearing, it's great. I would just also add, Tom, that I think it's, it's, it's even more helpful to the board if they've given you a memo as well. Okay. Sure. You know what I mean? Just, but definitely having them come to a hearing is it's extremely helpful. Kind of puts the applicant on the spot. Like, you can't just argue with a memo, right? There's an actual body there. Right. Okay. But we do ask that of the departments, Jim, so. Very good. Yeah. It has to be found through us. Yeah, in New Jersey, I just saw it. You know, they do it. Like, oh, your town had to meet the 10%, so, you know what I mean? We're going to cram this this uh, development down your throat because oh it's going to get you to your 10% and and then by doing that you know we kind of knew what was going on and then we kind of like well wait a minute now you you know you start to look at why they're cramming stuff in and then you go to the municipal row uh, to, to, to try and scale it back so I just wanted to make sure we still can consult with them absolutely yeah all right um I don't know what your experience has been in Martin um, mine is that it is possible to negotiate with developers. It's possible in the hearing process. It's also possible in what we call work sessions. And I never push this because, frankly, my experience is that some town councils think work sessions are great and others don't approve of them. And I'm not a lawyer. I'm a planner. So I always try to stay on my side of the line here. But work sessions are, the concept of a work session is um, that, say, uh, Paul and I, or maybe one ZBA member, maybe a fire chief or somebody, might have a meeting with the applicant outside the public hearing process to talk about specific technical issues. And then report back to the board, the full board at the next public hearing, what was discussed and what was agreed on. And of course, it's always up to the board, because the board ultimately is one of the authority here. It's up to the board to decide to decide, decide to accept or not um, agreements that may have been reached in a work session, but the advantage to the work session is it's it's a little more informal. It can be a little more more productive. You know, it's it's not something with a necessarily a closed door. If there's a CBA member present, then you really should have it open, um, so that you never are accused of kind of conducting a hearing process in, in private. But uh, I've seen this done all, all different ways, and I, I can just say it can be very really helpful if it's if it's open to the public. The difference between a work session and a public hearing is, at the public hearing, they have an opportunity to comment. That's part of the whole point of the hearing. But if it's a work session, they don't. They can observe, kind of like an open meeting law situation. They can observe, but they don't get to comment, and they don't have to take testimony at a work session. You can't. No decisions can be made because. No one can take the authority of the Board of Appeals away. But sometimes those work sessions can be helpful to work through issues. I've seen this in particular um, on kind of large multifamily developments where people needed to sit down and hash out concerns about design. And it was just much easier to have the applicant's architect, the peer review architect, the town staff kind of beating this up and, and trying to come to some agreement about some design changes that might work. That's just a much easier conversation to have in a work session than in the middle of a public hearing. Um, you don't have to do this. I'm just making you aware that many boards do, but I would always consult with your town council before you do, do anything like this and make sure the town council is okay with it. Because I don't know what they, you know, 
in the end, you have to make a decision that in which you're trying to balance the regional need for affordable housing against these local concerns. And the local concerns that you can consider are public health, public safety, environmental impact, design, open space, and planning. Let me talk a little bit about these. The, the ones that most people are familiar with are public health and public safety issues. You know, it's just not a safe site to access, or uh, the design of the project is somehow going to create a public health hazard. I mean, those are things that are just obvious. Um, environmental impact, you have to be a little careful with this because the intent of the law, again, is not to stop affordable housing. But if there's a significant environmental impact uh, of some type um, and, there, and it can't be mitigated, that's always the question, you know, is, there, is mitigation possible? If it can't be mitigated, then you have to sit in this position as a ZBA where you have to balance the regional need for affordable housing because you're under 10% with this environmental issue that can't be mitigated. And you have to decide which one's more important. That's basically what this decision process is. It's a balancing. Again, with design, you know, if the design um, has been kind of worked through, if it's improved, that's one thing. If the applicant refuses to budge on design and you think the design is horrible in terms of its potential impact on surrounding properties, it's not a question of whether you like the architectural style. It's about massing and scale and so forth. Um, is the is the applicant's refusal to budge um, more or less important than that regional need for affordable housing? How valuable are design changes to you as a board? Open space can be, and this is where I've, I've got capital OS here. Um, if a site is proposed for affordable housing, it happens to be in your open space plan. It's almost irrelevant um, in terms of the board of appeals because the, the, the perspective, again, just always keep in mind the perspective of this law is that there's a need for housing. Um, you can bring it up, you can say, you know, there's a problem with you building on this site, or you can even maybe try to negotiate with the applicant around reorganizing the layout to protect some of the open space. Um, but, you know, in the end, the fact that something may be listed in your open space plan as a potential priority purchase it, in itself is not a basis to uphold the denial of a comprehensive permit. Um, if there is an agreement to, to protect some of the land, um, you know, that's, that's a different thing. If the applicant agrees, for example, to a CR, a conservation restriction, on some of the land, that's fine. They can do that. Um, if there's a natural heritage issue, there's probably going to be a conservation restriction anyway. But that's, again, natural heritage, not you guys. So I would just say, you know, really, the way most of us think about open space in the context of comprehensive permit review is about functionality, usability, for the population that will live there. Um, and uh, and how you know just kind of how that open space is, is going to be arranged on the site um, in terms of its you know access to the units and so forth. Some comprehensive permits I've seen it done where a piece of land was important to the town they hadn't bought it. The developer was willing to uh, to provide some of that open space for public access, um, and so there was a restriction kind of ensuring public access to the land. Um, it all depends on how much site, fle site design flexibility there is. And then planning, um, this is a tricky one. If you have a master plan that recognizes affordable housing needs and provides for them, say the plan identifies areas in the community that would be appropriate for affordable housing. And, and you've actually issued comprehensive permits for some of those areas, or the town is zoned, uh, special zoning provisions to encourage housing in those locations. So you have a plan and you've implemented it and it's actually created affordable housing. And now you have a site in front of you that totally conflicts with that master plan. You may be able to deny a project under those circumstances based on inconsistency with your master plan or inconsistency with your housing production plan. But you don't get to, to do that and have your denial upheld unless there's been an active, consistent track record in the community to implement that plan and that plan provides for affordable housing. So it's sort of like a, 
planning is part of the statute, but just understand that there's a lot of restrictions wrapped around it. Does anybody have any, these are sort of, the, this is the balancing test. These are the things that you can consider. Are any of the impacts associated with these local concerns sufficiently mitigated by either the design of the project or agreements reached during, during the permitting process that, um, that the local concern is addressed as much as possible and then the need for affordable housing then outweighs that local concern. Deliberation sessions, you know, some, time, some boards just kind of wait until they close the hearing and, and really, you know, deliberation ought to come later. But I would just say, as we already talked about earlier, before you close the hearing, have a conversation in the public hearing about potential conditions and, and, and talk about the waivers and whether you're going to grant them. Because that way the applicant is on notice what the board is going to require in the permit and the, and the public knows. And so there's an opportunity to have a discussion about, about what the permit's gonna say. The, the downside of not doing that is that then you close the hearing and now you can't take any more testimony. So now you're looking at a draft of conditions for the first time and the applicant wants to say, are you kidding, I can't do that. And you can't take that testimony. Um, and so it's just a bad place for the board to be. So believe me, as we're kind of going through this and we're keeping our eyes on a 180 day timeline, uh, there's this point where we know we need to start having something in front of the board to talk about as potential conditions and potential uh, decisions about waivers. So the applicant knows what's coming. Uh, as I think you already know, we basically have three options under the comprehensive permit law. You can either deny the project if you simply can't. It's a balancing test I talked about earlier. It's not possible for you to find in favor of the regional need for affordable housing because of some significant impact that can't be mitigated. Deny it. Um, if you think you're over 10%, you are actually over 10% and you want to deny it, you know, deny it. Um, you can approve a project exactly as it comes in. I've never seen that done, but it's possible. Or approval with conditions, which is typically what the boards end up doing. Um, and that's partially because uh, if you simply deny the project and the applicant goes to the Housing Appeals Committee, your position is much weaker. Whereas if you've approved the project with conditions, it sort of, it kind of narrows the scope of the appeal so that the focus is on these conditions that are objected to. So, you know, those are your options, and I would say um, always make sure the town council sees a draft of the decision before you file it. Now, that doesn't have to happen before you close the hearing, but you want to make sure the town council sees the decision because if somebody's going to appeal, you want town council to know what you've said. Um, the, the conditions that you uh, impose in approval of the conditions should not make the project uneconomic. And so this is why, again, having that conversation with the applicant is so important. The conditions that you impose have to be consistent with local needs, meaning that you can't impose conditions on the project that kind of go beyond the scope of your authority. You have to be careful when you're talking about density. I try so hard to get boards not to use that word and to instead talk about design, scale, massing, and so forth, because those are things you actually can consider. But density alone is not something you, you can directly regulate. It always has to be related in some way to one of those local concerns that I, I have listed on the previous slide. Public health, public safety, environmental you know, impact and, uh, and design, those are things that you can consider. So always try to focus your comments. And I would say, Paul, uh, in working with your colleagues, town departments, heads and so forth, drive home the point these are things the board can consider. So focus comments on these areas. It really makes the board's life so much easier. If the applicant's unhappy, the applicant can appeal to the Housing Appeals Committee if you are under 10%. Um, anybody else has to go to court. Once the applicant's done with you, let's say the project's been approved, they still have to go back to the subsidizing agency for a process called final approval. And I will tell you, there are projects that die at this point. <laughs> um, final approval is where the subsidizing agency figures, well, you know, they've got their entitlement, so now we're really going to look more carefully at this project. This is typically where um, they, they'll, they'll require a market study to really determine that the project is, is, is realistic. 
Um, and, and there's just, you know, a whole lot of review for financial feasibility and so forth that happens at that post comprehensive permit process. When the applicant's ready to build, goes to the building department, and that's when final engineering and architectural plans have to be filed. That's when the fire department and so forth is going to really sort of scrutinize under their departmental regulations uh, what, the, what, what the project's going to have to do. Um, so there's a lot that happens after the ZBA process. Typically, the plans that are referred to in your decision are, we call them like approved plans. And then these plans are coming at the, at the building permit stage, we call them final plans. Um, and that, it's not uncommon at all for applicants to come back to a CBA and say, oops, I need to, I need to, I need an amendment my, to my permit. I forgot to ask something. Or we have to make a change to the plan because whatever. Jimmy, so they have a right to, pardon me? Yeah, yeah Judy, we, we've got, we've had a series of requests for insubstantial changes and what Paul and Nicole and you know Town Hall has to realize, and I'm not sure how it works in the age of COVID when nobody's at Town Hall, but when, when these things come in, the 20-day rule is, I think, a little ridiculous. It is stupid. Nobody's yeah. abided by it, but guess what? We got one one year on December 4th. Oh, God. So the 20 days expired on Christmas Eve, and uh, I don't remember when it was, and the um, applicant actually said that it was totally unintentional and you know I he's a nice enough guy and I believed him but uh, you know we had to get uh, I forgot what we did in that case if we got a, a written agreement for an extension or if we just met one night to uh, deem it uh, you know substantial therefore opening the public hearing is the next step but you know Paul and Nicole if you ever get a letter on a, on a permit that's been approved you got to sort of assume that it's a request for a change for a is it called a change? It's a notification. Yeah, okay. You gotta just sort of assume that it's a notification of a change. Absolutely. And, and get it. Step the meeting right away. Right. Okay. You only have 20 days. Hopefully not Christmas Eve. Right. <laughs> yeah, because there is this very tight turnaround period here for determining whether it's substantial. And if the board thinks it's insubstantial, that's fine. You know, it's just done. But if the board thinks that there is there are substantial implications to the change, then then the board has to call a public hearing. And the public hearing, of course, is only on the change. It's not about reopening the whole project. Um, there has to be a regulatory agreement entered into at some point by the applicant and the subsidizing agency. That agreement gets recorded with the Registry of Deeds. It's what governs the affordability restriction, the, you know, the monitoring for the both finances and, um, and also compliance with the, with the restriction. Um, typically, there is a provision for kind of what happens when the subsidizing agency's role lapses. Uh, it, it, this is something that we can talk about with the applicants uh, in their projects is uh, what's been happening kind of today in modern times is that applicants will agree to put up some modest amount of money so that the town has the ability to hire someone to monitor the deed restriction when the subsidizing agency's role expires. So you have a way to make sure that the units stay affordable. Because if you don't, um, someone could come along later and challenge the continued placement of those units on the SHI. So there is a long-term monitoring obligation that comes with these projects. But for the first 20 or 30 years, it's handled by the subsidizing agencies. Um, the applicant has to come up with that, that fair housing plan and a lottery plan for uh, advertising the availability of units receiving applications for them and selecting their tenants or homeowners. Um, and so all these things kind of come into play. There's the permit can lapse within, you know, after three years if the applicant hasn't activated that permit. Um, the applicant can request a transfer of the comprehensive permit. You guys don't have jurisdiction over that, but you get notified of it. The subsidizing agency basically has to decide is the person to whom this permit's gonna be transferred competent you know, especially if it's a rental development. You know, are they qualified to uh, to own and manage this project? And then, of course, there are inspections during construction. And for complicated projects, or for very small towns where the uh, inspectional services department may be short-staffed, typically, if the building department says, or the fire department says, we're going to need some extra help to inspect, to, to review this project during construction, 
typically the applicant will agree to provide some funding so that peer review consultants can be involved during the construction process. That doesn't always happen. I just want you to know it's not uncommon. My God, I got through it. <laughs> I'm always surprised when I get to this slide because I can't quite tell when we're going to hit that. But um, anyway, ask if you have questions, by all means, go ahead and ask. Something I didn't cover that you expected or? Judy, there's a lot here. Yeah. I think I need to thank you because I think you've done an excellent job at an overview of the process. So thank you on behalf of the board. I'm not closing off questions if anybody's formulating them. But it, your email is here. Can you explain to Paul uh, what, to what extent do we have Judy's services going forward on either of these projects, if at all? Okay, so at least the status, uh, Chair, as you know, you signed two applications from, uh, from Mass Housing Partnership that would be uh, who would be contracting with to retain Judy services throughout the process for both applications. I see. So I, uh, as soon as you gave them to me, I sent those to the to uh, Brad, our, the chair of the, the select board, for his signature. Okay. Uh, as soon as I receive that, I send that to Mass Housing Partnership, and uh, then that will ensure that Judy's on f with us for both projects. So basically, Mass Housing funds our ability to retain Judy or some of our ability? Mass Housing Partnership. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. The yeah, that's the agency that has the consultants list for 40B assistance. Okay. That's so they, they end up kind yeah. of entering into a contract with me to provide help to you guys. So yeah. hopefully we would have Judy available at our meetings, is that right? Although we don't have that yet, we might not have it for the opening meeting, obviously. Oh, I think you will. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> we <I> <laughs> I, I may have um, a bit of a conflict one of those nights. Did you say the 22nd and 29th, Paul? Yes. Are those the date? Yeah. Yes. So the, the 29th, I may have a conflict in Hingham. I'm going to try to work it out that someone else in my office can be available to Hingham, but that was a previously scheduled appointment. So I'll let you know. No, definitely available the week before. But just to have Judy available to sort of guide us through the process, even though I've been through it too many times, uh, you know, the regulations have changed, I think will be invaluable. So thanks, Paul, for that legwork. And uh, I'm sorry I can get them back to you off right away, but uh, I finally did. We won't say when. And uh, we'll, we're, we're good. good. We're good. Paul and Nicole did a lot of work to get those contracts, those applications, I mean. Well, thank you. Uh, in place. And hopefully we'll have Judy available to us. At, in real time at the meetings, at these yeah. Zoom meetings going forward as we take these on. Um, MHP is really great. They do turn this around pretty quickly. Okay, great. But yeah, they, they have been extremely helpful. Yeah, aren't they wonderful? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, one thing uh, I want to just put out for the board, too, is since we're more than likely going to have two, the 240Bs, we might want to think about having them on the same night, um, yeah. particularly because of Judy's time. Uh, we'll have to work with you on the next meetings on the peer review. So we'll probably want to think about how do we handle the two projects? Uh, how do we coordinate the two projects as part of your review? And, and, and certainly make sure that we can also, that the board can also handle, you know, any new uh, variance applications that come in. So. Well, consider. Do you have other applications aside from the uh, 15 uh, Hawthorne that we've continued? Do we have any for the 22nd, which is two weeks from tonight? Do there's a there's a second one that was continued, and I'm not remembering what that was. Nicole, do you happen to? So 15 Hawthorne, Tom, you had mentioned you wanted to get on this agenda, and then we also had 157. I believe it was Paul that um, that mobile park near uh, the Great Woods Plaza. Oh yeah. So we have those two. Um, that's what I, I looked at that today to double check. So I believe that's the other two we have. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm forgetting what 157 was about, but the point is, we're opening the 40 Bs separately. We'll have to, as a board, discuss whether it makes sense to 
then have them on the same night or rather continue staggering them you know, a few weeks apart each one. Um, it's, it's totally up to you guys. I mean, I I worked with um, Andrew with ZBA several years back when they had two large 40Bs come through the door literally within a week of each other. Huh. They had been, Andover had been over 10%, and one of their older mixed income developments decided to go market weight. So but their, you know, the restriction on the units had expired, and so Andover fell down to like 8.8%. And two 300 unit rental developments came swooping through the door literally almost within a week of each other. Oh. So in their case, they ultimately, I think after the first hearing or two, they had both of them on the same night. And part of the strategy was for the to force the developers to see what each other was giving, um, you know, to the town. It was very funny to watch, very, very strategic. But some of it, too, is just about managing people's time. So that's totally up to you guys. Um, well, I, I can say from experience, it's tough to keep the facts of, of two applications that are large applications, keep them separate. And at least for opening, they're separate nights. And I, I think that's good. But we'll, we'll have to talk about it as a board. If you can. You know, review the applications, uh, which I haven't done more than just the uh, you know, first couple of pages or the historical uh, letters that we've gotten this this past spring. Um, I, I still won't. Uh, I haven't dug into them. Paul had to remind me tonight that you know we do have them. Uh, just review them ahead of time so you can at least get the facts in your head. Station there, but it, it's a little difficult to keep them separate. At least it, it had been for me when we had two before. Oh, it can be. It can be. It can be tough. But we'll, we'll talk about it going forward. Any, are there any questions for Judy right now for a process? You can also ask, of course, in two weeks. But we have a question about the site visit. This is Al. Yep. Um, if we do have a site visit, is that a time where we, it's a noticed meeting so we can actually ask questions and go back and forth, or are we just literally walking around looking at the trees? So you're going you're gonna to love this answer. <laughs> I've had town councils argue both ways. I have had town councils say, oh no, it's subject to the open meeting law, you have to notice it. That's what we've done. But you can't deliberate, right. and you can't talk to the abutters. But recently in another town, the town council said, I don't consider it subject to the open meeting law. And the problem of course is the applicant has the right to decide whether to allow the public to walk on the land. Right for insurance purposes as well as uh, exactly yeah. exactly so my view is it should be posted um and that people need to understand they can't talk to the board and you guys can't talk to the public but it was very interesting to me the first time ever i've had a council say oh i think it's i don't think it's necessary for the board to post the meeting i thought okay a great question Alan. and in the past what we did to my memory is we were very strict in talking among ourselves and with the applicant and re applicant's representatives, but not to s state things, just to ask questions and get feedback. Exactly. Not to get any sort of response to what we were learning, and then again, abutters, just no interaction with any abutters. So it's kind of a tricky process, but we did notice them as public hearings, I guess, or meetings anyway, Judy. I think it was smart to do that. Of council, you know, council led us to do that. So, just so you know, we even did a, we even did a balloon test on one of them. So, where we, the height of the building was in question, so we had to float yeah. balloons so we can see how high the uh, peak would be. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm seeing that too. Any other questions right now? I do thank you very much. Thank you. I look forward to working with you. I'm sure I reflect the board uh, members uh, in saying that. Paul uh, and uh, Nicole have done a great job in keeping these up for us. And um, two weeks from tonight, we'll start in. And well, I look forward to it. Thank you. And Judy's uh, email is here, although I guess it, you know anything we communicate with Judy on the application will become part of the public record, of course. But if you have any general process questions, I'm sure, um, you know, we can, we can email Judy in the next couple of weeks anyway. And, uh, ask Absolutely. You. Or you can you come through me or Nicole and we'll yeah, probably, probably smart to go through Paul so we all get the benefit of the same thing, right, exactly. That works. Great. Thank you and good night, Judy. Thank you so much.
And thanks, Chris, Chris Carmichael, building inspector, and to our conservation uh, agent uh, and uh, fire chief, uh, assistant fire chief, associate fire chief, deputy fire chief. Sorry. Uh, thanks to all the uh, um, people who participated tonight. Appreciate your interest. Please uh, be part of this process because what we decide is only a factor of what input we get from the other town departments. Correct. Uh, I agree. So do the departments have the uh, basic plans now, Paul? Everybody has all the same information. Okay. So at the opening meeting, we'll, we'll say to we'll do some sort of communication to the department heads to say, please attend next time, you know, uh, and tell us what you think. Um, well, off to a good start. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, and we have a business to come before the board tonight. This is a hearing, I guess, with a do something to close it out. I was just going to ask Paul if there's been any conversation about opening town hall or and getting back to public meetings in person because things are opening up slowly and surely. If there's any, I haven't seen any specific guidance from the governor um, specific to you know, public meetings yet, but I just wanted to pose a conversation. Yeah, the, uh, the selectmen are supposed to be talking tomorrow about it. Um, you know, we've, we've, you know, we've been back for a couple of weeks but still closed but this but the town has gone in and upgraded and put in you know plastic you know put in uh uh the, the plastic nice. offerings, you know except if you're in an area like ours where we have a little bit but a person could easily walk back and you know um but we'll see what they what they do um although i was going to too. Say, i'm sorry I'll tell you, I'm going to be there too. I want to pick up all those binders tomorrow, if possible. And you said, uh, Nicole had said you might be there in the afternoon, you know? Yeah, I'm, I'm there. I'm there all day. So, three, four, uh, half a day. Day. Although, I, I was, I'll have to ask uh, one of the applicants for more copies because I, being in the digital age, and I'm trying to, you know, you know be uh, resourceful to say that just give me the, we'll count on the digital copies. So, it is hard too in these meetings to go back and forth and bring our own computer to try to pay attention. Yeah. Um, uh, That's one point too, Alan. One ninety five is the one Al, what oh, Paul and Alan. One ninety five is the one that left us actual binders and they're still yeah. in that box. So right. I guess the yeah. left I had um figured would be the first pickup anyway. Yeah, we'll we'll have to ask the uh the agent for two fifty three. Yeah, we're plenty of one with kind of 195 stuff, 253, we have yeah, all of 195. Everyone's 195 is the first one? Yeah. I'm, I'm, to ask, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go oh, ahead, please. Could you please ask the applicant to always make sure I get a copy as well? Because yes. Yes. when I'm trying to help you draft a decision, it's just a whole lot easier if I've got my, my legal file and the application and everything is in it than to be trying to go back through. Um, Maybe you want a, pay, a hard copy too? Would you want me yeah. to mail you that? Well, okay. I'm, I don't think you should have to mail them. The applicant should. Well, be okay. <laughs> but I mean, we, it really it makes it, it makes things so much easy, more efficient. I hate to say it because I prefer to have digital copies too, but but for these cases, it's just better if we have yeah. the application and the, the correspondence. So yeah, the last one we had uh, plans that were 20 pages, you know, so. We right. need to thumb through the pages. Right. It's hard to keep track digitally. If you, we need it digital as well. It's right. part of the regulations, Paul and Nicole, that we've yeah. talked about that we want to have a requirement that we get digital as well as paper. But it gets confusing if it's just in the ether on the computer. So the there paper, is a binder available for. Yeah, I'll, I'll, be picking one up. I'll be picking one up too. So. Yeah, so just let us know when you're coming. We have 195 and. Uh, available right now and 253 will we'll work with the uh, agent okay. to get more thanks and we'll make sure Friday. judy gets them we'll make sure judy gets hard copies for both thank you okay um, i'll be in again friday if anyone needs to stop in on friday to grab that too what time are you doing till nicole well well we're we'll, we'll open till 12 30 so i'll be there till 12 30. Okay. if i need to i can put one in your mailbox <laughs> <laughs> If you, if you want to, that would be great. <laughs> Give me a reminder Friday, and I will. <laughs> All right, awesome. Thank you. Yeah, we, we could certainly, if it's easier, we could certainly deliver it to your 
you know, I don't have your addresses, but if we get that too, it's just, we can do that. Yeah, we, you know, we have new addresses uh, on the file, but anyway, um, thanks everybody, Paul, Nicole, and Judy, of course, um, for getting this uh, scheduled and done. It's been tough, but uh, we appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, real quick, if you don't mind. Of course. Hey, Paul, um, I don't know if you know, but I think last week, uh, I got, a, well, I got a letter saying they approved me for another two years. Yeah, right. So congratulations. <laughs> Yay. Is there a raise in pay? What's that? Is there any raise in, in wages? Oh, yeah. Yeah, cost of living. From zero to zero. I got to make at some point, probably next week, an appointment with the town uh, to be sworn in, I guess. Yeah, okay. yeah, just... The clerk, there's always someone from the clerk's office there, but it, it doesn't hurt to give Lucia or Brooke a call and just say you're coming in. I just want you to know, in, yeah, in case you get notified that I got, I'm got, i going to try and do it next week. I'll just, like I said, I was on vacation this week. Yeah, well, okay. Jim was saying the Army, uh, they asked for volunteers and they say everybody steps back and you yeah. step back, so you can re up for another better <laughs> I mean, they must like it when I drive and don't. That's Right, when you're driving and meeting, you can't step back, I guess. <laughs> That's uh, dedication. Uh, there's nothing else to come before the board tonight. There's a lot of work ahead, but we will do it. And thanks, everybody. Um, is there a motion to adjourn at um, 8.47? Yeah, Don't be shy. I'll make the motion to adjourn at 8.47. Is there a second? Come on, guys, it keeps waiting. Okay. Um, unfortunately, I have to do a roll call, but Mr. Gennari, how do you vote? Yes. Uh, David, how do you vote? Yes. And I vote yes as well. Congratulations, the meeting is adjourned.